There we go. Welcome everyone to California EL Civics Basics. Uh, I'm Lori Howard, and I'm here today with Stephanie Fitzpatrick, CASA's Program Specialist. Um, we're going to talk about civic participation and IELCE requirements for WIOA agencies and best co-op practices for CAPE agencies. Basically, just to say for you CAPE agencies that um, you are not required to follow the rules, but we feel that the rules that WIOA agencies follow are the best practices, so we want to let you know that. And uh, because you might move into WIOA at some time, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go ahead and follow uh, the WIOA requirements. So today our goals and objectives are at the end of the session, you will be able to identify the requirements of the California WIOA Title II AFLA EL Civics Grant. We're gonna tell you what all that means, specific to civic participation and the same rules apply to IELCE. And then identify the best practices for CAPE agency use of the California Co-op system, which is uh, encouraged uh, by the legislature as well as the California Department of Education. So just as we start, I just would like you to, on a little piece of paper next to you, just characterize your understanding of California Civic Participation and or IELCE um, or the best practices for CAPE agency use if you're a CAPE agency by just rating on your paper from one to five. I don't know much is a one and five is you're an expert. If you're an expert, you don't need this session, but if you are and you want to stay on, feel free. But don't tell me, we don't need to see it in the chat. This is just for you to know what your self-assessment is of your understanding of civic participation and IELCE. And then hopefully at the end that will have improved. And many of you are putting your name and agency in the chat. And if you would continue to do so, that would be great. Okay, I hope you've written either a one, two, three, four, five on your paper, and then we will put that aside and we will revisit it at the end of the session. Okay, I'm going to hand this over to Stephanie Fitzpatrick, who's going to uh, continue on with the description of California EL Civics and the requirements <clears throat> therein. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. So. Um, what is EL Civics? So it is California English Literacy and Civics Education, which uh, promotes the development of integrated programs that incorporate English language and literacy instruction. So uh, that's basically ESL and also civics education. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, EL Civics is funded under the 2014 Adult Education Family Family Literacy Act. So we're going to be saying that's uh, AFSA, um, and also the Workforce Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Title II. So we shorten that to WIOA Title II. <clears throat> so WIOA II defines English literacy and civics education as uh, English services, which enable competencies in English language and also advanced skills needed to function effectively as parents, workers, and citizens in the United States. So it includes instruction in literacy and English language acquisition, uh, rights and responsibilities of citizens in civic participation, and may also include workforce training. So under the umbrella of EL Civics, uh, we have um, agencies can hold classes in one or more focus area. So uh, citizenship preparation is one, and that's funded under the 231 fund. Civic participation, which is also under 231 funding. And the last one, IELCE, uh, this is uh, workforce training, and, and that's uh, funded under 243. Uh, all right, so uh, for CAPE agencies, um, the uh, California legislature recommends that CAPE, so CAPE is California Adult Education Programs. Uh, so CAPE agencies utilize the California Co-op system for instruction and assessment of students to demonstrate the I-3 Immigrant Integration Indicator Outcomes. So to shorten that, we, we say I-3. It looks like a 13, but it's an I and 3. So. 
Um, also, uh, oh, go back, Lori. The Tops Pro Enterprises, uh, which we shortened the TE, uh, records I3 outcomes. And you can see the California Adult Education website here. So all these um, links in the presentation, uh, you can link to uh, the documents that we are talking about. Uh, all right, so increasing CAPE I3 outcomes to demonstrate program effectiveness using COAPS. So the California EL Civics Civic Objectives and Additional Assessment Plans, so we shorten that to COAPS. Uh, they can be used with ABE, ASE, and CTE students. Um, they were originally developed for use with uh, ESL students, but they can also be used now with ABE, ASE, and CTE students. Uh, Co-ops can be used to plan instruction and assessment to demonstrate efficacy in real life tasks, uh, such as completing a job application, consulting with a school counselor, or uh, making a consumer complaint. Okay, so these assessments are very uh, real world uh, based. Uh, all right, so for successful implementation of co-ops for CAPE agencies, so um, to know which level of material to use, uh, this is a very handy chart. Uh, so if you have um, a beginning ABE literacy uh, level student that scores uh, below 203 on the CASAS uh, reading goals test, then you would use the intermediate low level materials for that student. So this is a very handy chart to have. Uh, if you're not sure which level of materials to use with your ABE, ASE, or CTE students. Next slide, Lori. Okay. So uh, the EL Civics and IELCE, it has the opportunity to build on competency-based education. Uh, it connects language instruction to the real world. Uh, utilizes performance-based assessment to evaluate how learners use the language and measure possible learner success in the community. And it also connects English learners to the workplace. So specifically that is IELCE. Uh, so there's a, a question from uh, Margarita. Uh, oh, it disappeared. What is the question? I'm sorry, I don't see it. Um, let me look in. Oh, can a, oh, can ASC and CTE students use 231 or 243 co-ops? Yes, all the co-ops are available to everyone. And also, uh, let me answer a couple of other questions, if I may. Uh, so someone says you, you don't see the slides, but I... I'm seeing them. Uh, is every, everyone else seeing them? Are you seeing them, Stephanie? Yes. Okay. So it, it is your issue. I'm so sorry. Uh, the link to the slide deck uh, will be, uh, I'll show you where to find it. It'll be on the CASAS website um, under webinars. If it's not there already, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, find out if it's there now, but you will uh, be able to access them and we'll let you need them. And someone is suggesting just change your view top right corner. Thank you for the advice. For clarification, ASE students can use co-apps, right, but you don't get payment points if they pass. So um, what you do get is I3 outcomes. And it po it's possible in the future that you might receive payment points, but not currently. Thank you, Stephanie, go ahead. Are we on the okay. right? Uh, all right, so um, the um, EL Civics uh, system is uh, based on a system of civic objectives. Um, they are uh, general competencies that help students access, access their community. Uh, so for example, employment is CO33, uh, and the description is identify and access employment and training resources to obtain and keep a job. Okay. And then within each CO, there are civic objectives and additional assessment plans. So we shorten that to co-apps. So a co-app is a plan for a performance-based assessment. So for example, a ta uh, the part of the assessment might be complete a job application or demonstrate successful job interview techniques in a, a, a role play situation. 
Uh, all right, so we have some requirements and for um, CAPE only agencies, these are uh, not requirements, but they are best practices. So that's why we'd like to mention it even to the CAPE age only agencies. So number one, develop and administer a school community-based uh, student needs assessment. And then um, after you administer, you need to complete a summary form. Uh, number two, select civic objectives and additional assessment plans. So select co-ops. Three, develop or borrow additional assessments. Four, plan and offer instruction. Five, administer the assessments. Six, uh, you, you need to have the students have a, uh, do a CASAS pre and post test. And then seven, for IELCE 243 agencies only, uh, you need to complete the IELCE report and plan. So the first requirement, develop and administer a school community student needs assessment. So, so successful programs continually at, at assess the needs and interests and language skills of their learners by conducting ongoing needs assessment. So this is a requirement to develop and administer a school community student needs assessment. And after you complete it, you need to fill in the needs assessment summary form. Uh, which you can get by clicking on the link here, or you can get it from the CASAS website, casas.org, under civic participation. Uh, you don't need to uh, turn it into us, just have it on hand in case um, of audit or you know, if some, your CDE consultant asks for it. Uh, all right, so we have two types. Um, of uh, needs assessment. The first one is a general needs assessment. So assess the needs of the student community as a whole. Uh, what EL Civics information do students need and want to learn? Okay. So uh, another type is the workforce training needs assessment. So which career pathways need employees in the community? Which career pathways do students want to follow? And then English language learners who wish to gain training and employment should be given a specifically designed needs assessment uh, to determine placement in integrated EL civics and workforce training courses. So an optional assessment is the classroom needs assessment. Uh, so after the school, the, the, the general school community needs assessment uh, has informed the selection of co-ops, uh, this class needs assessment assesses the need of a specific class. And then um, teachers use the results to select from the agency chosen co-ops. So, but that one is option. Uh, all right. So how, how to do, uh, develop the student needs assessment is you choose two to four civic objectives from each of the six competency areas on the pre-approved civics objectives list. So we have the six areas here, consumer economics, community resources, health, government and law, transition, and employment. Okay. And the needs assessment will include about 12 to 14. So if you choose two from each, that's 12. If you choose four from each, that's 24. So that's why it's 12 to 24. Um, so approximately 12 to 24 civic objectives for students to choose from. And then the number of civic objectives used in the needs assessment may depend on the level of the student. So you may have fewer choices for the lower level students just so they're not overwhelmed with the information. Uh, all right, so sample civic objectives. So we have consumer economics, CO2. So this one uh, is to access community or commercial agencies to resolve a consumer complaint. Uh, another one, community resources, CO11, uh, is to research and describe the cultural backgrounds that reflect the local cross-cultural society, and that may present a barrier to civic <laughs> participation. Another example, health, CO26, identify or access free or low-cost medical, dental, and other health care services and insurance. Uh, government and law, CO45, is identify features of the legal system, including individual rights, laws, and ordinances, as well as procedures for obtaining legal help. Uh, and the last example here, transition, CO52. Research, identify, and utilize soft skills, um, like personal qualities, customer care skills, leadership skills. Uh, so those skills necessary to succeed in post-secondary education, training, and employment. Uh, all right, so use the chosen civic objectives to design a needs assessment. 
So beginning level learners need a picture-based assessment uh, with simplified words. So um, intermediate to advanced level students should have pictures and or phrases or sentences, uh, but giving the CO descriptions to student is not appropriate. So for example, do this at the top using pictures, use a bank, okay? So, but not this, the CO um, description at the bottom, C, uh, Civic Objective 1, identify, evaluate, and compare financial service options in the community, such as banks, credit unions, checking, check cashing services, and credit cards. So this one would be for the teachers to know what generally this topic is going to include. So the needs assessment needs to turn this description into pictures or short phrases that the student can understand. It's about using a bank. Uh, all right, so then you need to administer the needs assessment to a majority of learners. Ask learners to check their uh, three to five top civic objectives of interest. Then you tally the results, and then you use those results to choose from three to 10 civic objectives for your agency for that school year. So uh, once you've cho chosen those three to 10, uh, you need to review all the co-ops related to that civic objective and select co-ops that meet the needs of students in the content level and type of assessment. So we have different types of assessment. Uh, some might uh, include, some co-ops might include oral, uh, for example, a, a, a mock interview kind of thing uh, or a phone telephone conversation. Other assessments uh, include written, fill out a form kind of thing, or write an email to your doctor, okay? So uh, you need to select co-ops that meet whatever needs of your students. Uh, and then you need to complete the uh, WIOA 2 needs assessment summary form. Uh, again, you can get that form by clicking on that link. Uh, and you need to uh, report the process and results of the needs assessment. So tell us what you did and what the results were. And again, uh, you can find it at the casas.org under civic participation. And you just keep it on file uh, in case somebody asks for it. You do not need to turn this into CASAS. And can I also say it's really good to do that. So then if you happen to leave your position, then the next person can read what you did. And it, there's a nice description there of how it happened so that they can follow in your footsteps. Uh, great. So um, surveying um, uh, for uh, needs assessment for the workforce, uh, you need to survey priority job and training needs um, in your area, utilizing information from Workforce Development Board, AJCC, WIOA Title I Partners, and CTE advisory groups. Right? And then decide which job training your agency or partner agencies can offer related to job opportunities. So uh, you may offer that training at your site or you may have a partner agency, uh, for example, a, a nearby uh, community college um, that could help uh, partner with your agency. Uh, discuss with CTE and ESL teachers what level of uh, ESL students could participate in training with English support. Um, develop the needs assessment related to that job training. Administer the assessment. Uh, and then utilize the results to inform your agency's selection of training programs. Uh, okay, so um, you need to assess your agency's regional priority training needs and student training and career goals, and then utilize the results to inform your agency's selection of training programs to offer. Uh, all right, so to uh, select or create co-ops which best support the training offered, uh, we have an example of workforce preparation specific co-ops. So CO37 or 52 deals with soft skills. Uh, CO33, um, get or keep job skills. Uh, and examples of workforce training specific co-ops, these are all in the 70s. So starting with CO70, early childhood education, 73, information tech, 71, healthcare, 74, manufacturing and machine tech, 72, building and construction safety, and 75, accounting. So you need to complete the needs assessment summary form for workforce uh, IELCE uh, courses also. Lori, is it correct you can do both the ESL and the, the workforce one on the same form? They don't have to have two separate 
needs assessment forms, correct? Uh, sure. Uh, it, it just might be different students. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might not be asking your beginning level students that. So you might want to keep it separate depending on the levels. But it's up to you how to do it. Up to your agency, I mean. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, selecting uh, co-apps. So uh, the needs assessment re uh, results inform the selection of co-apps. So agencies use each plan, so each co-app to develop an assessment to give to learners after 30 hours of instruction. Okay? So the 30 hours of instruction in content specifically related to the co-app. So uh, agencies are required to select three to 10 co-apps so if your agency is selecting fewer than three or more than 10, uh, you must request permission from your CDE regional consultant. Uh, all right, so uh, there are multiple assessment plans for each CO. So each co-op is numbered. So the first number corresponds to the CO, for example, one. And then the second number designates the individual assessment plans related to the, the CO. So 1.4. So the 0.4 is the individual assessment plan. So 1.4 has different uh, tasks than 1.5, uh, but there are two assessment plans for CO1. Okay. Each plan includes assessments, tasks learners must complete to demonstrate what they have learned. And learners at each level must complete at least two tasks. So some um, co-apps, uh, for example, if there's a portfolio, um, portfolio assessments have more tasks. Uh, all right, so select co-ops that most closely match to the needs of your learners and your program. Uh, when doing so, please consider the type of assessment related to the language skills required. Uh, for example, do you want an oral assessment, a written assessment, a role play? Um, and so, but you also need to consider the content. So for example, in Civic Objective 9, locate and analyze preschool and childcare services, Co-op 9.3 includes written tasks. So the task uh, description lists characteristics of a good quality of childcare, and then evaluate a childcare facility, okay? And uh, that's different from 9.4 because 9.4 includes an oral and written task. So we have compared childcare facilities, maybe that might be done in writing, uh, but then the, um, there's also uh, tasks that present an oral report on childcare agencies. So 9.4 has an oral component. So once a co-app is selected, uh, the next requirement, uh, number three, agencies develop or borrow performance-based assessments based on the selected co-app, which is specific to the needs of the learners of, and the program. And then requirement four, agencies uh, develop 30 hours of co-op topic-related ESL instruction to prepare the learners to pass the assessment. Okay, and we have a, a question here. It says, uh, Suzanne asked, just to make sure uh, she understands, we can use the tasks that are listed on the co-op. However, agencies are required to create the assessment. So the COAP is the plan for assessment. So the agency creates the assessment based on the plan. So you need to follow the, the plan, all the tasks that are there and develop an assessment. Or you can borrow that assessment from an agency who's already created it as long as you promise to keep that secure. But yes, the COAP is just the plan for the assessment. But it's important to follow it exactly what it says in terms of the task description and the rubric and the rating scale. Anything else uh, to add, Stephanie? Um, no. Okay, and, and I'm sorry, did you finish this this here? Yes. Okay, next slide. Uh, so the performance-based assessments, uh, they measure students' ability to apply the skills and knowledge learned from a unit or units of study and challenges the students to use their higher order thinking skills to create a product or complete a process. Okay. So uh, that's a def very definition of a performance-based assessment, which the, the co-apps are. Uh, all right, so requirement three, develop or borrow additional assessments. So um, additional assessments, the co-apps are performance-based, like we just mentioned. 
They assess how well a learner can interact with or access the community, directly relate to the civic objective and additional assessment plan selected, include tasks learners must perform in real life, such as talking with a doctor or uh, completing an insurance claim. Okay. Uh, and then uh, relate to instruction in topic and instruction type. So oral, written, or listening, reading, et cetera. Okay. So um, the following may not be included in performance-based assessment. So these kinds of questions you cannot use as part of your assessment. So true, false questions, multiple choice questions, fill in questions, except for applications. So if a task is fill in a, uh, like a medical history form, you, you're going to have a blank uh, medical history form that the student will be filling in that, as part of their assessment. Okay? So no fill in questions like, you know, fill in the blank in a sentence kind of question. Uh, no matching and no text boxes which offer students possible answers to the question. So no uh, word bank at the top that students can choose from to do their uh, task. And just to say that the reason this is so is because the co-ops and the whole system was to assess whether a student could access the community and do so of his own, his or her own, or their own volition, you know? Um, so we don't, students don't have a piece of paper in front of them when they go talk to the doctor, for example, or do a job interview. So um, we wanted to make it as realistic as possible. And these kinds of uh, tests and questions don't simulate real life. Um, we have one a question that says, uh, yes. maybe you can answer, do co-ops need to be done after 30 hours of related material? Can they be done before that? No, so that is 30 hour requirement. They must be done after the 30 hours of instruction. Uh, but may I say some, some teacher, some schools decide to teach all the material for task one, for example, then give that part of the assessment and then teach all the material for task two. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that could be a decision you make, but each student would need to do both tasks. And so if you do it that way, you might end up with some students who've only done one of the tasks and then they can't pass the assessment if they've only done one task. Exactly. So, we so, can leave that part up to you, but but understand the difficulties that might happen if you do it in parts. Mm -hmm. And then there's another question. Uh, if a co-op is selected in 33, can different subcategories be chosen at different levels within the adult school, like 33.2 for some and 33.5 for another? Uh, yes, but um, if you choose um, uh, different subcategories um, in the system, it, it, you're going to uh, it's going to kick up an e email uh, uh, alert saying you must email uh, uh, Lori or me to uh, ex explain why you need to do those. And because some of them have tasks that are the same, uh, not everything exactly the same, but maybe like task one for 33.2 and task two for 33.5 are the same task. So that would not work because, you know, th th that would be students might be double dipping, like they might do it in 33.2 and then use the same information to pass also 33.5. So um, that's why we asked you to send us an email saying, how are you planning to use the 33.2 and 33.5? so that uh, you can ensure that it's uh, going to be used with uh, different groups of students, that there won't be a double uh, a double dipping, as we say. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, moving along, uh, develop your agency's assessments based on the co-op selected. So you can use other agencies' excellent assessments as a model. Uh, find other agencies who have selected the same co-op and ask to review or borrow their instructional materials and assessments. So you can see co-ops selected by other California agencies by clicking on this link. Um, for example, co-op 47.2 developed by Torrance Adult School, you can get from this link here, EL Civics TAS curriculum. Um, and you can also request the assessment and then you have to promise to keep it secure because it is a high stakes assessment, right? Uh, and uh, you need to be selective uh, and revise as necessary. So if you get something from Torrance Adult School, maybe your student population is just a little bit different. They're, your your agency students, maybe their needs are a little bit different. So you need to revise as necessary to meet your learners' needs. 
Uh, all right, requirement four, plan and offer instruction. So civic participation and in IELCE instruction prepares beginning low to advanced students uh, to access the community by participating in real or simulated communication and or interactions. So uh, literacy students can participate, uh, but agencies will not receive payment points until the student scores 180 or above on the CASAS test. So I know some classes, they have mixed levels and it, it's kind of awkward to offer instruction to one group and not the other. It's, it, you know, logistic uh, wise, it's easier to offer it to the entire class, but just know that literacy students cannot receive payment. Uh, all right, so the uh, civic participation in IELCE instruction includes all four language skills. So listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Uh, it is not limited to the language and literacy objectives listed in the co-op. So the um, language and literacy objectives, you can see what it is uh, part of each co-op by going to this uh, link, pre-approved civic objectives. Uh, it lists supplementary language and literacy objectives for each CO. Uh, so the instruction lasts at least 30 hours, utilizing content specific to the selected co-op. And uh, there's a, a note here for 30 hours of civic participation or IELCE instruction. Uh, you can include classroom instructions and text materials that are already being covered in a related instructional unit. So say, for example, you choose uh, 52, which is soft skills and uh, you have a handy dandy textbook and there's one section in there that talks about or you know, has exercises um, you know, about soft skills, that can be part of the 30 hours. Uh, all right, so plan civic uh, participation in IELCE in instructions. So your options are to develop a 30 hour instructional plan, which will prepare learners to take and pass the assessment. You can borrow instructional materials, for example, Co-op 48.1, um, developed by Torrance Adult School, and you can access that by going to that link. Um, you can rely on individual instructors to plan at least 30 hours of instruction for the classes. So they can utilize textbooks and su supplementary materials. Um, they can view lesson plans and instructional materials for EL Civics at uh, www.otan.us. Um, and the last option here, you can utilize the EL Civics Instructional Materials Exchange uh, available at elcivics.otan.us. So this is a, a repository of uh, materials created by different agencies that uh, they were willing to share with uh, the rest of the agencies in California. Oh, we have a question um, from, um, from Michelle. Do you see it, Stephanie? Uh, oh, is it uh, is the difference between civic partic participation or IELCE instruction based on the co-op chosen? So we'll, we'll get to that. There is a list that um, uh, delineates whether a um, co-op is 231 funded, so that's the civic participation, or 243 funded, which is the IELCE. So uh, you, you need to refer to that list, which there's a link later in the slide deck to that list. And so that list tells you, is it 231 or 243? Okay, and, and I'd like to answer the next question from uh, Millie or Miley, I'm not sure, sorry, not to know how to pronounce your name. But uh, you said, can co-op instruction, the 30 hours overlap with the, three, the CTE instructor's curriculum? And it should overlap. That is exactly what the a single set of learning objectives is all about. However, the ESL teacher needs to be teaching that content because what we're talking about in IELCE is that the ESL teacher is teaching the language needed to succeed in the training. So yes, the content should be the same. Um, the, the soft skills needed, for example, for a home health care aide to uh, take vitals uh, so they would learn how to say, uh, excuse me, you know, give me your arm or uh, I'm going, this is what I'm going to do now. So the content should be the same, but it's the language related to the training. I hope that's clear. And, oh, and yes. And then uh, Michelle asked about um, how you know if it's a 243 or a 231 co-op. And I put in the uh, chat, the link to the chart and there's little crosses there. You're right, it's called the sword actually. Uh, that 
designate whether something is 243, has been approved for 243 or not. So all co-ops are 231, but the ones with the little swords, they call them, um, are the 243 designated co-ops. And Miley says uh, the ESL instructor needs to provide the 30 hours, and that is correct. Or if your CTE teacher is a certified ESL teacher, they could also be providing it, but it needs to be any, someone who is a, a certificated ESL teacher. Sometimes that overlaps. Okay. Okay. Uh, so moving along, the next requirement is to administer the assessments. So um, they can be in, administered after 30 hours of specific COBAP related instruction. Uh, it can be administered by an outside assessor or the classroom instructor. Um, and again, after appropriate instruction, if a learner does not pass the assessment. So if uh, you have a student who doesn't pass the first time uh, and then you uh, review with them for X number of hours and then they, take, they can take it again and pass and that's okay. Uh, so very important co-op assessments must be kept secure. So um, students earn payment points by passing the co-op assessment. So that's why this is considered a high stakes. So they must be kept secure. And uh, how to secure its uh, ensure security uh, is, um, you know, uh, proctoring the test. Uh, so not just giving the, the worksheet to the student, okay, go finish this at home and bring it back. No, 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 it needs to be proctored in the presence of the, the proctor, the teacher. Uh, it might be a, another like instructional assistant that's in the, the classroom, but they must be proctored. Um, the storage of the assessment. So um, it, students don't have access to that prior to the test day. So only on test day or only when they are testing, uh, do they have access to the assessment. Um, so online access is an issue. So you need to ensure students cannot take pictures of the assessment and ensure that only students who are taking the test can see the test. So uh, we had a, a incident where um, a school was using, I don't know if it was Google Classroom or something, and they thought they were just releasing the test to the students who were in that classroom, the online classroom at that moment, but they found out that other students who were in like the night class could access it at the same time as the morning class. So that was a, a security issue. So we need to make sure that that kind, type of thing doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, James says, can their own teacher proctor their own class? Yes, they can do that. And uh, just, all right. Let me just add in that, you know, for written tests, it's not uh, of concern. For oral tasks, optimally, someone else would give an oral assessment just because our students learn how we speak as their teacher. So if it's possible to have a, a, your co-teacher or someone else give an oral test, that would be optimum, but it can be the, 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 uh, the own teacher. Classroom teacher. Yeah. Classroom teacher, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, um, so the, uh, going back to the ensuring the security, so it uh, becomes very important, especially if you have online classes. So remote testing is allowed, but there are um, different rules that you need to follow uh, when you're doing um, remote testing. So for example, if you have a student who's uh, sick on the day of the test and they wanna take it online with the teacher on Zoom, that's okay. Or you know, if they have childcare issues, they can't leave the child at home, so they need to take the test online. Um, that's another possibility, but that is also allowed. And we have a couple of questions. Um do we always need to include an oral assessment? Oh, that was to me, sorry. I uh, So, uh, sorry, it wasn't out there. Um, uh, so it, you assess whatever the tasks are that you've chosen, you know, whatever co-op, whatever it says. So if the co-op includes an oral assessment, yes, you need to do it orally. You need to do the instruction orally and the assessment orally. Uh, if you've selected a co-op that is just written, then it's just written. So it's whatever the co-op, uh, says and you have your your agency is able to choose, uh, you know, not only which co-op, but, but because it is a certain kind of test, a written test or oral test, whichever you feel you can do. And then uh, I think there's one other question. Do you want to take that one, Stephanie? Sure. Do you see it? Uh, it says, uh, can you clarify um, for this year, ESL students that score outside NRS level six do not obtain a payment point 
only those that are pre and post test NRS level one to five obtain a payment point for this um, program year. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I saw in our data last year. Okay. So for um, EL civics, as long as the student has a pre and post test, we don't look at the, the, the scores. So as long as we can see that they have a pre and post test and they pass the co-op assessment, then they will get a payment point. Yeah, so you should check your data for last year. It should not have kicked those students that are over 236, for example, out. Um, so you might wanna check that and then contact one of us if, if that was the case or contact your program specialist and see if you can work that out. But yeah, EO Civics doesn't doesn't relate to those uh, numbers. Right, uh, and then we have another question. So if someone misses a test due to vacation, et cetera, we can proctor an online test even if everyone else took it in person. Yes, that is correct. You can do that. And one more. Uh, can the pre post uh, be within the school year or before? Or where did it go? Yeah, so it's within the school. Sorry, uh, uh, any time in in the program year, the pre and post test. Yes. So Jamie says, is there a report where you can track who has a pre and post at EL you know, Civics? Our data person doesn't give us info. Um, you should be able to get it from that. I mean, that's part of the data person's job is to um, keep track of that, right? Because you you can't get a payment. I mean, there's no point in doing the co-op assessments if they don't have a pre and post because you won't get the payment point. So that's a well, very crucial part of that. Yeah, I mean, we still want to get, give them the pre and post test, but yes, but but WIOA requires the both the pre and the post to to uh, give offer a payment point. So yeah, I would talk to your data person about that, or talk to your administrator to see whether you can get that data. And there is a teacher portal. Uh, I'm not sure if you would be able to get that information through the teacher portal. Stephanie, do you know that? No, I'm not sure. Um, okay. The does, teacher portal is still so new. <laughs> does anybody know that? If anybody knows that, please answer that in the text. But anyways, uh, you should be the, your data person knows that information. So, and you should be certainly trying to get as many both pre and post tests as you can. So that should be a, a focus of your data collection. So it's a good thing to talk about at your agency. So we have a, a, a question from Connor. Um, if Jack, the student, is a beginning low student, passes co-op one, uh, one year, uh, but needs to remain beginning low the following year due to listening score and ability, will Jack be able to take the same co-op in year two? Yes. Yeah, so it's by program year. So every year you could take the same co-op. We wouldn't normally, we hope that the student would be at a different level and take a different aspect of that test. But yes, it, it's possible if they repeat that they would could take the same co-op. Did we get to all the questions? Oh, so uh, James says that they, um, the data person says they don't need the teacher portal. So I would uh, go and talk to the administrator to see because uh, Jill says that you can get that info through the, the teacher portal. Okay. Um... Okay, and Iris says that the teacher portal shows you all the assessments. Good. Okay, I think we answered that. Um, okay, great. Um, so just continuing you, on the, oh, was that Lori? No, go ahead, sorry. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, we just talked about insurance security. Um, so test security policy ensure that all co-op examiners read and sign the test security policy. So there is um, a document that, um, the proctors need to sign, the examiners need to read and sign uh, to certify that they will keep the test secure. Um, and there's a, a local assessment policy. Uh, it describes the actions to keep co-op assessments secure. So this is um, a document that describes uh, what exactly you are doing to keep the assessments secure. And each agency needs to fill out the local assessment policy. I don't know if it asks specifically for your co-op assessment, but since you are doing co-op assessment, be really good to describe how you run your co-op assessment. And again, for anyone coming behind you, in, you know, in, in future uh, doing these assessments, it'd be great to have a description of how you do it. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so uh, guidelines for keeping the assessment secure, whether using paper testing materials, um, technology, or online tools for EL Civic assessments. The agency is responsible for ensuring that only proctored students can access and submit the assessment. So that's the important, whether it's in person or remotely, uh, the agency must uh, has the responsibility to ensure that only proctored students can see it. And we do have a new FAQ on this in our system, on the FAQs on our EL Civics website, if you need to show this information to anyone at your agency. Uh, all right, so uh, students completing additional assessments must be evaluated on an individual basis. So oral interviews, for example, uh, or role plays uh, must take place in uh, participation with an assessor. So the teacher or whoever's uh, administering the assessment needs to be doing the, the other part. So students say something that the, the, the proctor says something, you know, back and forth. Okay? So uh, which means that no student to student interaction is acceptable as part of the assessment process. So it must be student to proctor. Uh, written listening and oral report assessments can be administered in a group setting, but each student must complete the whole task on their own and the assessment must be evaluated individually. So if you have a written assessment that you're giving um, to for whatever co-op that you're doing, you can give it to the whole class at once, you know, pass out the papers and they each fill out their own paper and then that you collect the papers and then you grade each student's answers uh, for um, the co-op. So each student gets a pass or a no pass uh, according to the uh, level rubric. All right, next requirement, the CASAS testing. So uh, civic participation and IELCE learners must take a pre-test to measure their skills upon entry and also take a post-test to measure improvement. So the staff, someone on the staff must complete an entry record or equivalent for the learner and then complete an update record or equivalent for the learning. So uh, a, a note here is one person from each WIOA Title II agency is required by the CDE to take CASAS test implementation training. Uh, so requirements to earn payment points for WIOA II agencies only. So learners must take a CASAS pre and post test. So a learner can earn one payment point for completing a level on a CASAS pre or post test. Uh, and then learners must take the additional assessments based on the co-apps and will earn one payment point for each assessment passed as described below. So students can earn a maximum of six payment points uh, per year for passing a co-app. So the student can uh, take three assessments from 231 funds and three from 243 for a total of six payment points. So um, there is the list here again, the 231 and 243 funded civics objectives list. That's the one with the that designates with the little sword if it's 243. Uh, all right, so um, this is all about um, remote testing resources. So uh, CASAS came up with this uh, during the pandemic when we were all at home. And so uh, we've developed uh, guidelines and rules that uh, you need to follow if you are testing your students remotely. So uh, we have things like the, um, uh, I can't read it. Lori, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> um, just the CD remote testing memorandum, the remote testing agreements, and the CASAS multiple choice uh, tests. So just different information. Sorry, is everybody having trouble reading that? Should I make this? It is pretty tiny, uh, but it's showing you a place on the CASAS website uh, at California remote testing. If you look there, you'll get to this section. This may be tiny also. So it's just more um, remote testing resources on the CASAS website. All right, requirement seven. So uh, agencies need to complete an IELCE report. Uh, and this is for IELCE 243 funded agencies only. Right? So they must complete the IELCE report and plan. And uh, the IELCE report content summary, and it's due well, just let me just say, this, I should have changed this. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, it just happened this summer that the, the deadline is at March 30th. 
So we uh, moved the um, deadline to March 30th. So you'd have more time for the SIP and other things, you, other data that you need to um, send in on April 30th. So we've we've moved it up to March. Is it March 31st or March 30th? I, I think it's uh, March Whatever 30th. the last day of the month is. Yep. I think it's, well, whatever it is, I'll, and I'll, I'll fix this before I send, uh, post these slides. Okay. okay. So um, thank you so much, Stephanie. These last uh, slides here, 45 and 46, just recap the, uh, the seven um, uh, requirements. Uh, but let's move on to just see if you have any questions about anything. You've been asking terrific questions. Thank you so much for doing that, for clarifying um, our statements. And uh, just any further questions before we move on to the next segment? Also, feel free to take a stand-up break here. We're going to go till 2.30. Uh, but um, citizenship class. So we're not going to talk about citizenship. There's so much stuff with civic participation. But if you stay on at the end, we can try to answer your questions, OK? But let's keep this to civic participation and uh, IELCE. Lori, uh, this is Will from Tustin. I want to clarify a question that was done quite a bit earlier about um, students who test outside of the NRS level six, uh, if they are testing outside of that, but still in an advanced ESL class, you're saying they should still be able to count for a co-op passing. They'll have a pre and post test both outside of the range of the advanced level NRSL level six, but they would still get a passing score and a payment point for the co-op. Correct. So as long as they've taken the post test, it doesn't matter what score it is. Okay, because I, I will agree with the other person. I, I don't see it that way in my reporting as well. Uh, once they're out of that range, we're not getting the co-op uh, payment point for that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, so we, we should talk about that. So those of you who have that situation, why don't you text, I'm sorry, email elcivics at casas.org and we'll discuss it and get back to you. But that is my understanding. It is also my understanding that if the student took a um, uh, another approved NRS test, like uh, uh, goals, that it would also count. It just has to be an approved an NRS approved uh, CASAS test, <clears throat> and that is how we work with our CTE students, et cetera, et cetera. So, but anyways, email me, and then we'll see if that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Uh, or email eocivics at casas.org if you would. And there's another question here. What is the definition of concurrent enrollment within the school year? So uh, optimally, it would be exactly the same time as the ESL instruction is happening, that that student would be participating either in co-teaching, co which would happen exactly at the same time, the ESL teacher in um, the CTE class, or it would happen simultaneously in the same week. There are situations that that uh, require it to be a little bit different from that. But you know, if you have a specific situation, why don't you talk to your program specialist or to me or Stephanie about that? And is it necessary to encourage test A and test B versions? No, there there's only there's one test. Okay. Right. So Stephanie already answered that. Yeah, there's no test A and test B for co-ops. It's just the test. You give the test, as Stephanie said, You offer, if they don't pass, you offer instruction and then give the, the test again, or maybe even that section of the test that they didn't pass the first time. And there is RNTE, um, a place to put a, a, a not pass and then to put a pass. So you have different places in TE to report a not pass and then a pass. Uh, for creating curriculum occurs, how many ESL program managers are creating on their own, or do you have a team? Uh, feel free to answer that question. Again, when this funding first came out, as Stephanie said, in the early 2000s, we often had an ESL civics coordinator and the team uh, teams at schools developing materials. Uh, nowadays, it's up to the agency to uh, decide how those materials are going to be developed. They're often developed by the EL Civics coordinator themselves, or again, borrowed from the EL Civics Exchange or from other agencies. Um, 
Okay, and if if you you know you want to have a coordinator, that's up to your school administrator and you know your your decisions as to how to run your school. Um, okay, Norma, you've sent me a direct message, so uh, why don't you write to write this to elcivics at casas.org, and I will, uh, or, or Stephanie or I will respond. To participate in ILC and receive funding, do you need to have an active IET? Yes, you do, because um, ILC is all about training and the uh, support of training. So it's all about training. You need to have training programs that are supported with ESL, uh, and that's what IELCE is all about. There is a training, um, I think, in the resources here, uh, how to plan and implement an effective IELCE IET program. And if you have questions about that, why don't you watch that webinar, look at those slides, and then uh, get back to us with questions. And Stephanie says, yes, you can borrow from the, or adapt from the EL Civics Exchange. We do have a lot of materials there. Okay, good, that's two messages, let's see. For IELCE, what do you do when not all students in the class are taking the in-home healthcare program? So, so I'm assuming you're talking about doing a co-op in a an ESL class that um, you're using to support a workplace, you know, residential care program. So you, you need to work that out. You need to either have a separate class that support either co-teaching or a separate class that supports them, or within your regular ESL class, um, you know, have designated. Uh, different topics going on and maybe some of the regular ESL students are doing one thing while your people who are in training are working on the co-op that supports the training. So that's just, uh, you know, regular instructional management. And again, if you have questions about that, why don't you email us at elcivics at casas.org. Okay, I think uh, one more question. For IELC, how do students identify as English language learners? We try to recruit ELs, but it's not clear all students are EL. So, uh, so EL has nothing to do with scores. It has to do whether they're a native English speaker or not. So anyone who's a non-native speaker can qualify for IELCE and get support in their language. Okay, let us move on and continue to ask questions. And I'm going to take this, this next Part, talking about the co-op selection process. Also, Lori, the um, in for the um, identify as um, English language learners. There's a section in TE that um, the um, person registering that student for the first time they they can uh, designate that student as a non-native speaker. Thank you. And, and no, normally, if they're in an ESL class, they would take steps, but they could, if they're in an ABE class, but they're receiving training, they could take goals. Okay, so, but when you say ESL students, so it says, uh, I didn't know that any non-native speaker counts as EL, but you need to be enrolling them in an, an ESL class where you can teach IELCE. Okay, so they, they need to be they need to be designated in a in an ESL class uh, as a, an IELCE class. Okay, so it's an EL, but in a in that kind of class, so that you can do the instruction necessary, so that that supports the training. Okay, so let's move on to the co-op selection process. It says again, co-ops must be selected on the CASAS EL Civics web page and hopefully your agency has done that. I think about half the agencies who are funded have done it. I encourage you to move ahead and do it as quickly as possible. At least one needs to be selected by October 31st. And then after you, your agency selects, be sure your agent, your data person downloads them into TE because you won't be able to report your pa uh, pass or not pass unless they're downloaded into TE. So make sure that happens. Okay, and most agencies select option one pre-approved co-apps. Those are the ones that are on the website and you just need to follow them for your assessment as instruction as Stephanie described. <laughs> and just to talk about the system more specifically, 
There are 61 civic objectives. They are numbered 1 to 55 and 70 to 76. 41 happens to be a deleted number. The reason we have two sections is because the 1 to 55 are the more general ones. And the 70 to 76, we put in a special place because those are specific to workforce training and they were designed that way. Um, but it, 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 all co-ops are 231 funded and the ones that are designated by that little sword uh, are 243 designated. Okay, um, and 33 of them have been designated for 243 and you can find them again at this list, which we have put in the chat and also here. Stephanie, feel free to uh, read the questions for me and shout them out if necessary. Thank you. Um, so, um, so option one, uh, again, these names come from when the program was first started. As I said, most people use, most agencies use the pre-approved co-ops. And um, there are multiple co-ops for each civic objective. And there are approximately 185 co-ops in total. And you can view them all at the pre-approved co-ops list, which you can find. It's one of the first bullets on our Yale you know, Civics page. You can um, find them all there and look to the right and, and click on details and you can see what uh, what is involved in each of the co-ops that are listed there. Okay, but we also have an option too. And that is because the wisdom of the of the CDE consultants and, and uh, educators, visiting educators who designed this program um, was that this be a dynamic program. So although we have pre-approved that make it easier for agencies to just select a co-op, we do want it, uh, the co-ops to uh, resonate with the community that they're being used with. So if you find that the pre-approved co-op doesn't meet the needs of your agency, you can participate in a revision process with the EL Civics team to develop a co-op that meets the needs of your, um, your agency. So you can either, as the first bullet says, select from the tasks that are pre-approved uh, or consider writing new tasks or do one or the other, you know, take one task that's already there and uh, write a new task, for example. But the the way to do it is to make sure that the co-ops that are developed challenge students at all levels. One time early on in this process, we had an agency say, well, I'm going to take task one, which is usually the easiest task, from these two uh, co-ops and put them together. But Though that doing that did not challenge the students at all levels. So when we revise a co-op, we want to make sure that there's challenge there because the whole purpose is to make sure students can participate in the community. And if we don't challenge them, they're not going to be able to do that. So if you want to revise a co-op, again, look at what's there. See if you want to take from the pre-approved or write your own tasks. Write a brief description of what your tasks that you propose and submit it to EL Civics at CASAS.org. And the EL Civics team will uh, work with you. Usually it takes about a month, depending on um, you know what it is you're proposing, to go back and forth and make sure that we have a co-op. We can either make it, if it's we don't feel that it would meet the needs of everyone, we might make it specific to your agency. Or these days we've been trying to put make them pre-approved so that everybody can use them. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, if, if it's just for your agency, you would submit it into the option two section, and then it would become, uh, uh, your, the co-op that your agency can use. If you do have one that's just for you, it doesn't become pre-approved, then you must select it each year to keep it alive in the system. So, uh, the number then becomes just the civic objective number, like number 11, for example, might be on your list if it was just written for your agency. So, it says, can ESL classes work on 243 co ops if they're not IELCE? So, again, all the co ops are 231. So, all the co ops can be worked on by a civic participation agency. But if you're a 243 agency, you must use the the ones that are designated for 243. Hope that's clear. Okay, option three. Option three is for something new. So um, we haven't had very many of those over the year, but some. So when we first did the system in 2004, 
five or six, I think someone said, nutrition is missing. We don't have a nutrition co-op. So we added number 46. Then Torrance Adult School, Stephanie's uh, former uh, agency, uh, decided we don't have anything on technology. So they developed 47 and 48. Uh, then we developed one for the um, census. And now uh, LAUSD is developing for social emotional learning. And then the, all the workplace ones have been developed because of training programs, et cetera. So we hope that there are new things that are happening. If you think there's something new in your region that needs a new co-op, a new civic objective and the co-op that relates to it, again, write to us at elcivics at casas.org. Similar process. Tell us what you want to do, why it needs to be there. Give us a rationale. And we will look at it and work with you to develop it. And again, if you if you have the option three, just for your agency, it must be selected each year uh, during the selection process to keep it live in the system. Okie doke. So uh, just to reiterate a little bit, agencies may select between three and 10 co-ops. I think Stephanie mentioned this before, if you wish to select more, you have to make a request, uh, a short rationale to your CDE regional consultant. And then you have to be a designated person, the ELC primary or ELC secondary EL civics coordinator um, to select the co-ops, not anyone can do it. So you need to email your program specialist to submit the name of the designated person and report any changes to, to those contacts. Um, Jamie asks, if you have an IELCE program, are the 243 still double payment points from the 231? You're talking about the value of the payment point. So if a 243 payment point is um, earned in an IET class, in other words, the student is taking both IELCE and workforce training, then it is a much larger amount because that is the preferred, right? That, a that agencies are having students participate in training. So uh, last year it was somewhere over $300. If the student is not taking training, but participating in a 243 co-op, then it would be closer to the 231 fee, which last year was around $100. Remember that the payment points are are like a pie. There's a certain amount of money. And then depending on how many people request payment points, the pie gets divided up. So the, that's a different uh, amount every year. Um, okay, and Stephanie's answered some of these in print, which is fine. Anything else I need to answer, Stephanie, orally? Nope, that was it. Okay, great. And we're thrilled to have your questions. That's why you're here, so glad. Thank you so much for your questions. Okay, I think I did that. Okay, so deadlines. October 31st, as I mentioned, at least one co-op must be submitted. Please don't wait until the deadline. Please ask your uh, designated person to submit now. You just have to choose one and you can change it. If you decide later you don't want that one, you can remove it. The October 31st deadline is just to make sure that we that you have access to the system and you don't have any problems accessing it. Okay, so that's what that deadline is for. So just submit anything to get into the system uh, or something you've used before, even if you plan to change it. Don't, don't feel like you have to have decided everything before you can meet this October 31st deadline. And then the last date to add, edit, or delete co-ops is April 30th. Um, and if you're writing a new or revised co-op, uh, we, we really need you to submit that before March 30th so we can have time to work with you. We usually need about at least a month to make sure, depending on how big your changes are. If your changes are not very much, it might just take a week. If it's a whole new co-op or civic objective, we may need even longer than a month. So that's what that's requiring. So, Lori, I just wanted to put, I, I have a typo in my answer. I put 20, but it, I meant 10. If you want to select more than 10, uh, you need to get permission from your CDE. Yeah, and so just write to your CDE consultant with a with a um, rationale. If your agency has already, you know, once you get a number, let's say you you're asking for 15 co-ops. Once you have 15, you can choose any co-ops within that 15 number. If then if you want 16, then you have to ask for permission again. Otherwise, it's just a one time request. <clears throat> Okay, we just want to tell you this program has been really successful. 67% uh, of California ESL students who participated in it um, 
approximately 99% of them took the co-op assessments and more than 90% of students who took the tests passed them. Uh, again, we don't expect a 100% passage rate, especially the, the first time. We expect a more of an 85% passage rate, and then perhaps students um, might um, uh, take the test again. If 100% of your students are passing, your test is probably too easy. So again, you're in charge of doing the, of making the test. So make it a little more challenging so that about 85% pass and then give more instruction to those who, who might need it. Okay, we want to show you our resources. Um, again, everything you need to know is at the California Civic Participation IELCE page. The link is here. Um, if you want to ask questions, please email us at elcivics at casas.org. Um, these are trainings. This is the training that we you just participated in. I have a link to it here. I'll, I'll make sure that link is up to date the, with the current version. And you can find on our website all the slides that go along with these as well. So we have this session, which is the most general, and then a little more specific, another training, Understanding and Implementing Co-ops, which you can also find the training and the slides there. As I mentioned previously, planning and implementing a new IET IELCE program. If you're new to that, please view this training and then contact us with any questions. Related to that, developing a single set of learning objectives. Um, and then these uh, helping ELLs move into careers or models for preparing ELLs for the workplace all have to do with IELCE and show you models from agencies who are successfully doing it. A document you might want to look at each year is the Civic Participation ILC FAQs. Those are the frequently asked questions and things that you might not have heard here in the training today might be there. And we suggest you read that every year. And also let you know that we have an EL Civic support channel. So um, all the trainings that we do um, and the uh, EL Civics network meetings and then the presentations that are given at the EL Civics Network meetings and other resources are on the EL Civics support channel. We hope you'll go there and find any information you might need. Um, and a question, are we required to save student work? And yes, that's one of the FAQs. I'm not sure if I have it as a slide here. Um, did you answer that already? Yes. Oh, no the 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 requirement. Um, I can go to the FAQs in just a minute. I think we'll have some extra time to look up that FAQ uh, and tell you what you're required to keep each year. So okay. the, um, I answered the question about the, the saving the student work. So um, if it's part of the co-op task, then yes, you do need to keep that. Um, the student work. Uh, for example, portfolios require the submission of students' work samples as part of the co-op task. Okay, and did you give the rules for for uh, for keeping? No, not yet. They didn't ask about the rules. Oh, but... okay. I thought they did. I'm sorry. Maybe I read it. Oh, save copies of student work. Well, that has to do with yeah. So, so that's part of the FAQ. Let me let me go to that. Okay, and just to say we have EL Civics Network meetings uh, held more or less monthly. The next one is coming up next Wednesday, September 25th. We'd love to have you attend. You can register for it at caadultedtraining.org, and then you'll receive a, a link to come. Uh, it's a time that we share information, and then agencies often um, uh, share what they're doing. We're going to have an, ag an IELCE agency share some information next week. I, I will, those of you who are on my list um, and you can get on my list or our list by emailing elcivics at casas.org. If you want to be on the EL Civics Network meeting list and you're not already, you'll receive a reminder about the meetings and then just any other information that comes up. Okay, we want to talk a little bit about the EL Civics Exchange, which I know Stephanie mentioned. Um, it's a joint project of CASAS and OTAN, funded by the California Department of Education. And it has materials that, age, that have been vetted that you can use for your uh, agency. And then 
um, it tells you which agency developed them. And then you could ask that agency for their assessment that goes along with it. You can find that at elcivics.otan.us. And when you go there, it looks like this. I don't have my up to date. Well, we've added, I'm not quite up to date here. We've added a, a set of materials uh, in transition. Huntington Beach gave us some of their materials in soft skills. So um, I will make this up to date too before I post these slides. Um, but this is what you see. You click on these tiles if you want to look for materials, or you can search the number that you're looking for here. If you're a new agency, you might want to see what's here and available to you and then offer the needs assessment based on what's here so you can use these materials. Uh, just starting out, it's a good idea to use materials and so it's not so overwhelming for you um, at the beginning. Um, these are the materials that are available. The newest ones are highlighted. Uh, so it tells you what's there. I'll update this as well. So I think we've added some things to this. And uh, just to let you know, if you are developing new materials, we'd love to have you submit them to the EL Civics Exchange. And uh, as you develop them, we need you to make them accessible. This is not only for materials in general California, but to make them accessible to your uh, fellow teachers, your students, make sure that uh, someone who needs to use a screen reader or has other um, perhaps disabilities could access these materials. We are willing to help you make your materials accessible. So if you're developing or revising materials, let us know and we'll help you make them accessible so that they can be submitted to the EL Civics Exchange. Uh, that's what this is. Uh, also, we have some resources online, the accessibility guide. Anthony Burek from O10 is willing to actually assist you one-on-one -on -one so that you can submit them to the exchange. Okay, uh, just this is a journal article I wrote if you want a history of, of uh, California EL Civics. Um, if you want to know more about it, you can access this article. Um, and all know that if you have questions about policy or fiscal issues, you should be contacting your California Department of Education regional consultant. Um, if you have questions about instruction, assessment, or data collection, you should talk to your program specialist. And again, if you go to California Civic Participation, you'll have a link on the left-hand side menu that gives you access to know who your program specialist is and an access to um, a phone, phone number or email address, I think, to find out who your regional consultant is. And if you have any general questions, always you can email elcivics at classes.org. So uh, I think we have uh, identified the requirements for you and hopefully you've gathered that and you've had, those of you who are CAPE agencies have um, uh, identified best practices. And we'd like you to once again, to go back to your piece of paper and rate yourself. How would you characterize your understanding of California civic participation and IELCE now, if you're a WIOA agency or if you're a CAPE agency, what the best practices would be. And if you would on your piece of paper, um, rate yourself from one to five. You may not be an expert yet, but maybe close to that. And we hope you we've given you enough information that you've raised up a little bit from one to two, from two to three, I don't know, but hopefully something. And we also hope that you will be sharing this information that you've gotten, either by um, telling your administrators, teachers, or TOPS for enterprise staff, or by suggesting that they also view this uh, webinar. I'm going to go to the EL Civics page so that I'll show you where you can find this webinar and slides uh, when it is posted. So let me go there and then I'll share it with you. Whoops. There it is. Okay, so this is the EL Civics page. It's at, you can find it at casas.org. And then uh, on the left-hand side, over in this menu here on the CASAS webpage, you would, um, let me go there so you can see it. So when you go to the CASAS webpage, hopefully, yeah. So this is the CASAS webpage. Hopefully you're seeing that. And if you scroll down to the left, you see California EL Civics. You click on that. 
and you get to a landing page, I think first, and then you can see all the information for California Citizenship Preparation as well as EL Civics. Here is the link that takes you to find out who your program specialist is or to give you contact information for your CDE regional consultant. We're gonna go to the civic participation page and here you have everything you could possibly want to know about that. Hold on, I think I, I lost it. Sorry, let me share that again. I lost it for myself, maybe not for you. Maybe it's still there, let me get rid of this. Yes, it's still there for us. Still there for you, not for yeah. me to find it. There we go. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Okay, so if you scroll down, you see all the information. These first four items are the most important. The pre-approved additional assessment list. We told you where you can find all the co-ops. If you're the designated person, you're going to select your co-ops here. If you want to find out what other agencies are doing the same co-op you want and maybe borrow materials from them, you would go to this link here. This gray section has all the major documents, the language, the pre-approved civic objective list that Stephanie talked about with all the other language and literacy objectives you might use to make your instruction more robust. Um, this document here that shows you which co-ops are 231 and which are 243. Again, a lot of, uh, here's the FAQs we were talking about. And I wanted to go there to download that document to show you um, the, how you have to keep your documents. So this is a little small, let's see if I can, I always have trouble making things bigger. There, uh, bottom right. Someone help me, lower right, there it is, thank you. <laughs> there we go, good, okay. And if we scroll down, let's see which one it is. I think it's number seven, yay, right here. Number seven, what EL Civics data and information do agencies need to save and for how many years? So I think this was one of your questions, but maybe I'm wrong. But in any case, this is an important piece of information. So you basically need to keep samples of the test itself and of the student uh, work on the assessment or a score sheet for three years plus the current year. That's what this says here. And it comes from the CASAS administration manual that you can look up to see further information. And I also wanted to show you that we, we added in green anything new that happened after July 1. So if you haven't looked at this document since July 1, we just added the information, sorry for the scrolling, about test security. And uh, that was what um, Stephanie was sharing with you about the importance of test security. And we've added that one here. Let me go back to the uh, page and, oh, I know I was showing you where the webinars are. So here are all the webinars and slides. Right now it's from last year to 23 and 24, but um, after in a few hours, we'll have the this recording will be posted right here. You could share that with people at your agency and the slides for this session will be posted here. Uh, they're pretty much the same if you wanted to access them now, but they'll be the, the changes will be posted in a few hours. Okay, let me go back to the slides. And then see about any other questions you have. Okay, so hopefully I'm sharing my slides and we're back to questions and let me just move this here and see. I can check on the chat. Stephanie, is there anything in the chat that? Uh... Uh, no, um, someone just asked if you can, uh, if I could put that link to that um, the web page uh, in the chat. So I did that. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? If you want to stay online after this meeting, we'd be happy to answer any specific questions or someone's asking for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I'm, we'll, we'll try to help you as much as we can. Um, okay. Let me get to the last slide here then. There we go. My email address, I don't know why it's underlined, but Stephanie's isn't, but we have both of our emails addressed there. Uh, again, to reach either of us, uh, elcivics at casas.org is probably the best way to do it. Um, I've got 10 new messages here. I'm assuming they're thank yous. So we appreciate you attending today. Again, I'm going to close out the meeting if there are no other questions, and then we'll stay on the line for any specific questions you might have. 
um, a recording of the meeting where changes to the IELCE were discussed. It was. So I'm not sure what you mean, but let, so let me was, close this out okay. and then um, we can answer those questions. Okay, okay let me just, uh, there we go. Stop recording.